It's an absolute delight to be here with you from a very, uh, very smoky Portland, Oregon. So you can see the, the photograph there in the bottom right hand corner. That's what Portland looks like this morning. The air quality on a zero to 500 scale is about 344. So uh, it's pretty remarkable. It's pretty hard to breathe. So if you hear me coughing a bit, I've got everything closed up here where I'm presenting. So uh, it's uh, quite an experience, right? As you know, the, the West is reminding us how interconnected we are, right, by way of the climate. So it's one of the many ways, obviously. The city, of course, has been in the news quite a bit lately, and fire seems to be a common theme, so not surprising, right, that might uh, show up this way or manifest this way. But I do hope that you feel comfortable to type things in the chat box and where uh, the producer deems it appropriate, you might say something, right? Or we can convey questions. I really love the give and take. Let me back up here for a second and get back to the title of this. I'm calling this course the special sauce, a short presentation. And so you're gonna see, uh, I'm gonna present, make a series of suggestions. My background with the Erickson Foundation and clinical hypnosis, right, is gonna show up. So if I present something, it's probably going to come in the form of a suggestion, right? <laughs> so uh, feel free to give feedback along the way. I really look forward to it. So what I'm proposing here is a series of suggestions about a certain degree of some common denominators. You know, we're moving my organization. I, I work for several organizations, really. But one of the organizations I work for in Maricopa County in the Phoenix area really kind of hung its shingle and really hung its hat on the notion of integrated care. So we were hearing the word integrated care a lot, right? We're hearing the term trauma-informed care a lot. We're hearing trauma-sensitive or trauma-responsive care. We're hearing a lot of these terms thrown around quite a bit, right? Organizations, uh, including in Arizona, including the state's Medicaid plan, is using the term whole person care, complete care, focusing on the whole individual, the different domains of a person. So in a likewise fashion, I would suspect you'll find the structure of this short time together a little bit, maybe I'm all over the place, a little disjointed, and my hope is I'm, as I'm getting a feel with sharing this with you and getting some feedback from you, that hopefully over the course of it, it'll feel, uh, you'll find some common denominators, right? You'll start to draw from your experience and as Milton Erickson allegedly once said, if you give people a blank, they will, right, no? <laughs> and so in a similar fashion, my intention is to be, you know, kind of go and grab some stuff and make some suggestions. And then over the course of it, count on your ability, your experience, your know-how, your associations, your memories, and we'll see if we want at a place that feels relatively coherent for you, because I suspect you're going to do that regardless. And if you don't, well, we'll make good use of that too. So what I'm proposing here is, I'm gonna propose a number of different approaches, a number of different practices in our field, in professional helping, perhaps in psychotherapy in specific, and then let's see where that leads us. Give me a thumbs up, somebody, if you're hearing me okay still. I know that the connection can sometimes vary. Anybody offering a thumbs up that you're hearing me okay? Thank you very much, appreciate that, Jendler. Okay, and others? All right, so what's the special sauce? What is this element in common that kind of brings it all together? So I'll, uh, I'll see where this leads us. I'm hoping at the very least, we're certainly not limited to these objectives, right? But I'm hoping because I give you some of these notions, these different approaches that relate to trauma-sensitive, trauma-informed, uh, complete care, integrated care, modern psychotherapy, that you'll come away with at least finding one common denominator, taking advantage and utilizing, making good use of the different things that I'm putting out there for your consideration. No doubt they'll be imperfect. No doubt they'll be incomplete. No doubt they may not quite jive with your experience. I don't know how we avoid it. I think that's gonna come into play, but hopefully you'll find this kind of stimulating in a way or uh, provocative in a certain way, perhaps, maybe comforting that, that kind of helps you kind of feel like, well, yeah, yeah, that piece I like, that piece I like, and I'm gonna put that together based on what I wanna do with it. For that reason, you might secondly identify a model. Maybe you find some model, some approach, some part of that 
that coincides with your discipline, with your background, with your know-how, your memories. And I'm hopeful that you might synthesize your own special sauce, right? Whatever that may be. My job as a clinical educator uh, and an adult educator for the last, I don't know, 25 to 30 years has been, I think, to really kind of set things up that folks do that, to honor and respect the experience of the people showing up. So that's the, the relational stance from which I'm coming. So, you know, how many of you guys have heard that expression, right? I, I think it's probably best known in addiction treatment, but it's kind of like take what you need and leave the rest. So uh, that's what I'm offering, I suppose. So hopefully, hopefully you get at least one thing, at least one of these things, and certainly not limited to them. Okay. Here's some of the notions I'm going to throw at you, so to speak, figuratively speaking. And we're certainly not limited with these things. And I strongly suspect that because of your vast experience, you'll make other connections. You'll, you'll have other ideas come up. So we'll see where that leads us. So it's kind of like six different groups of folks or six different themes, I guess you could say. One of them has to do with the power of relationship and utilization. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak to my understanding, my memories, uh, the networks I've made, I guess you could say, as it relates to people like Scott Miller and Milton Erickson, who had a huge influence on all these people. have had an influence on my formation, obviously. And so I'll speak to the power of relationship and utilization, okay? I'm gonna bring in Burt Powell <clears throat> as well. Nadine Burt Harris and Bruce Perry. I was trained by Bruce Perry in the neurosequential model in caregiving, focusing more on what you do with foster adoptive and kinship folks. Those are most of my private clients have been foster adoptive and kinship folks who have come to me for help because guess what? They're getting triggered, right? They're getting triggered by being foster adoptive and kinship caregivers, right? We're gonna talk there, we're gonna to touch on the power of attachment, adverse experiences, right? We're already touching on stuff you guys know a lot about, right? This whole experience may come away as being mainly a confirmation for a lot of you in some ways, I suppose. And getting basic needs met and the power of getting basic needs met, right? I'll touch a bit on Lynn McTaggart and Brene Brown. And we're gonna pull in all kinds of people here, right? As it relates to connectivity and vulnerability and where does that, you know, what kind of suggestions might I make in that area? Then as you can see there, I'm gonna bring in, make some suggestions around the work of Laura Van Newt Lipsky and Elizabeth Hudson, who uh, Elizabeth Hudson is a, I think a Wisconsin native, right? So some of you may be really familiar with her work in trauma-informed care, but Laura Van Newt Lipsky might be a little more obscure, but I'm gonna bring her into the equation too. My mentors, in EMDR therapy, I'm a basic trainer for the EMDR Humanitarian Assistance Program. And one of my mentors, Ana Gomez out of Phoenix, really turned me on. I mean, I, I got, had some familiarity with Ken Robinson, thanks to some colleagues of mine in the education system and who are kind of really into the power of creativity. But Ian McGilchrist, the neurologist from Scotland, was one of the people I was assigned to study in my own development as an EMDR therapist and an EMDR consultant, facilitator, and, and eventually trainer. And then I'm gonna offer some examples of this special sauce in action, like when people pull these elements together, what does it wind up looking like? Now, there's no limit to that either, obviously, but I'm gonna offer just a couple of suggestions to prime the pump. Outstanding. So, oh yeah, I love it. You guys are already chatting. This is beautiful. Yeah. I appreciate that. So you guys might notice in the chat too, I would invite you to take a look at these as, as well. And I'm, and I'm perfectly comfortable front loading some of these things straight away too. That feels really good. Thoughts on trauma for children who are adopted at birth with research and experience about trauma in utero. A couple of things really stand out. I'm gonna type the name of somebody you might find really interesting. Haida Lise Alls from Harvard Medis Medical School has done a lot as it relates to looking at pre children who are born premature who might be exposed in utero. So you might really like some of her stuff. Uh, she's been featured on a number of shows before and she'll tend to say something that those of us who have a background in some of the more modern psychotherapies in the 21st century, you know, things like somatic experiencing and thought field therapy, EMDR, um, what am I leaving out? Brain spotting among them. We'll talk a lot about 
how do, how do you help people overcome the effects of those early insults, right? Those early traumas. And you might find some of her perspectives pretty interesting uh, of having to do with stimulation and to what degree do you make, I guess this is good front loading, to what degree do you make the therapeutic relationship a bit womb-like, right? You know, how do you make that therapeutic matrix, like we say in Spanish, la matriz, you know, uh, the, the actual word for both uterus or, you know, or womb, better put, and uh, the, the matrix, right? It lends itself to a lot of really fun stuff. You might find Hudley Saul's stuff really interesting about, okay, to what degree do we make things womb-like and to what degree are we modulating stimulation? And you guys are very confident are making all kinds of associations to people like Bessel van der Kolk and Dan Siegel and folks like that, right? As it relates to being hyper aroused, hyper aroused, the window of tolerance, how do people respond to so much, uh, so many needs not getting met early on. So that's one idea that comes straight away. So no doubt you're making other associations. Yeah, thanks, Ian. That's really good stuff. Yeah, that's beautiful. Okay. Feel free to, to type things in the chat at any point and I'll, and you know, to the degree that it might fit for you guys, I'll, I'll fit it in there. The power of relationship and utilization. So who knows what kind of associations you're having about some of these images. <laughs> Maybe it's a good thing a lot of you ate already. I don't know, <laughs> you might be thinking more about how to get your basic needs met. <laughs> you know, if, you, if we'd done this earlier, I suppose. I was educated by Argentinians, by the way. I grew up uh, with English and Spanish. I was, uh, I'm a product of bilingual education, and most of my instructors were from Argentina. And of course, one thing, if you know things about Argentina, right, they love things like chimichurri, and they love things like empanadas, right? So I thought of that. That came up for me when I was looking at this image. Don't know if that comes up for you. You might have all kinds of other memories, right? So Scott Miller of the International Center for uh, International Center for Clinical Excellence based in Chicago. I imagine a number of you probably have a lot of familiarity with Scott Miller's ideas and you're welcome to put things in the chat if I leave something out or if you want to have a different experience or you want to make sure your colleagues get some good information about that that maybe I'm not quite representing well. Of course, Scott Miller studied with Milton Erickson. Milton Erickson was originally from Nevada, grew up in Wisconsin, spent some time in Michigan too, right? Worked in the state hospital in Michigan did a lot of fascinating work. There are great stories, right? As you all may know, you know, so many great stories about Milton Erickson that was trained by the Ericksonians. And in getting trained by the Ericksonians, you run across a lot of people, right? You learn about a lot of people, you know, that have all kinds of stories about why we do what we do. And of course, Scott Miller's claim to fame is the feedback informed treatment. His training is really beautiful. He's a phenomenal speaker, tremendous adult educator, very good researcher. And his organization really focuses on simplifying, you know, how do we do what we do, right? Because we tend to kind of lose focus, don't we? We have a lot of pressures on us to create good documentation. For example, you know, we may spend more time documenting our great work than actually doing it. But with Scott Miller, I, I, I venture to guess that there's thing, there are things that Scott Miller's done a really good job of popularizing, kind of like a Carl Sagan in a way in our field of really doing a great job of popularizing what the research seems to be saying. In fact, I'm so confident of that, that if I tell you what, according to Scott Miller and his people, right, what is the one factor that best accounts for variance and outcome in psychotherapy? I bet you'll know it. You can, you can say it, you can type it. I bet it won't take seconds for someone to say it. What is the one thing that accounts for most of the variance and outcomes in psychotherapy? It is the therapeutic. Beautiful. So you're bringing up the alliance, you're bringing up the relationship, therapeutic relations. Yeah, very good. The relationship, lovely. And then you say, well, well, yeah, duh. <laughs> And yet, one of the things, and when I mentioned Laura van der Lipsky later, I'll bring it back up, is what seems to get in the way of us doing that? And of course, you know, when I've seen Scott speak, you know, speak, he can really get people upset, right? He's very provocative. 
because he'll insist on we can do be we can be doing all kinds of other practices some of them seem scientific and some of them don't some of them seem evidence or even best practices or even promising practices and some of them don't and yet you might wind up with really good outcomes and is that left to chance so all of that gets in there right scott miller uh, did something really interesting once bear with me i'm going to tell a story he once gave a presentation at a multi-day conference in Tucson, Arizona. And you talk about provocative. He was really provocative. You know, he can be that way. And he asked the audience, tell me why your clients don't get better. Why your clients don't get better. And people gave all kinds of reasons, right? Well, you know, they repeat offenders, they're addicts, they're borderline, they don't follow through, they come from a culture of poverty, right? Just all kinds of explanations, right? You know, they don't have any real incentives. They're not paying enough. They don't have a, a motivation. He said, this is fascinating. You've given me like 12 reasons as to why your clients don't get better, but none of them have anything to do with what you're doing. And so he discovered something really interesting, kind of a corollary, I guess you could say, that his group found out, okay, yeah, the therapeutic relationship and the alliance and the sense that we can work well together, Right, all get in there. The expectation gets in there where the theoretical orientation seems to not really account for quite as much as other factors like the relationship for the variance and outcomes. But he, it took it, he says it took his team a little bit longer to find out why people didn't make good progress. And he discovered that it seemed to have something to do with the ego of the helper. That if people get, if they don't get better or they get better, well, you know, it's because I'm good. I'm an autiste. I'm really good at this. But if they don't get better, he found that those practitioners, those helpers would tend to say, if you don't get better, that's on you. You're the problem. You're the common denominator. So Scott Miller's a bit famous for that. He really provoked the audience with that. And so his, and I happen to find quite a few connections by the way that he was influenced by Milton Erickson's work. Now, Erickson, right, you, if you know things about Milton Erickson, there are many great stories about he seemed to just take whatever people brought him. And so people like Jeff Sy, the director and founder of the Erickson Foundation in Phoenix, in Phoenix, Arizona, has probably done more than anybody, in my opinion, of really uh, popularizing Erickson's ideas and help give a language to all those wonderful things that Milton Erickson would do. He had this quality of being commonsensical. He seemed to be really good at making good use or utilizing his role as someone who was chronically ill, had post polio syndrome, had chronic pain, and could be a bit grandfatherly. But he was also a white psychiatrist, and that would afford him a certain degree of influence with a lot of people who might just assume that he was like the guy in the white coat. That's right? like the Milgram experiments. Right, he'd have a way of influencing people. And he'd just take advantage of that. Well, one of the terms that Jeff Sy coined for Milton Erickson's contribution, among many things, was the concept of utilization. Right. That he could he could take whatever people brought. In fact, there's a great story, and it's apocryphal. I, you know, I don't know how many people know that this happened. This supposedly occurred when Milton Erickson was working as a medical director at the State Hospital in Michigan. And the nurses came to Milton Erickson. Some of you may know the story better than I do. And so supposedly, the staff was going to Dr. Erickson. They were saying, Dr. Erickson, there's this gentleman who won't go to any group meetings. He won't go to the programming. Well, what's going on? Well, he says he's Jesus. He's dressing this way. He's offering people who tell stories. You know, He's offering people all these parables, all these stories himself. But he won't go to any of the programming. So Erickson goes to talk to him and says, so, I'm Dr. Erickson. Yes, I know who you are, my son. And he says, I understand that you're not participating in the program. So what's your story? Well, I think you know the story. So he tells a few biblical stories, right? And Erickson says, say, is it true that you're a carpenter? And the guy says, well, as a matter of fact, I am my son. I, I, I am a carpenter. Well, you know what? We're remodeling my office. Would you help us? They put him to work. And the staff came to appreciate him. So he wound up connecting with the people in the staff and they would miss him when he didn't feel well or he was more symptomatic, you know, would not have much energy and more, maybe more of the negative symptoms of schizophrenia perhaps. 
And the staff got to know him and they missed him. You know, he'd help out and he would you know, sweep things and he'd clean things up and he'd offer advice to the guys and tell stories. And they found that really uplifting. And when he wasn't there, they would ask each other, or ask Dr. Erickson, where's Jesus? <laughs> Talk about utilization. So instead of Erickson, what's that Ericksonian notion, right? Why do this? Why do this? Elicit only the power struggles. Elicit only those dynamics of that kind whose energy you're going to utilize. Like a keto, right? I'm going to utilize it. Instead of getting into some confrontation, trying to convince him that he has schizophrenia or if he's delusional, let me find out what his strengths are. Let me find out what his internal resources are, whatever they are. Let me find out his truth first and see what I can do to build on that and utilize it as opposed to living like this all the time. Now, if that sounds like a whole bunch of other stuff that you know how to do and you believe in, exactly, right? So that might be an example of a utilization. How are you guys doing so far? Hopefully I'm not boring you too much. Feel free to give a thumbs up or to say something in the chat. Lovely, thank you. Thanks for the feedback. Feels good to, to get feedback, kind of know that you're, you're getting something from it. Lovely, appreciate it. Okay. So now let me go for there and make a few associations or offer some associations or offer you to have some associations, better put, as it relates to attachment, adverse experiences, and getting basic needs met. You say, hmm, that's an interesting connection of things. What kind of dish would that be? <laughs> what kind of ingredients are we putting together here, huh? Well, for those of you who are familiar with attachment theory, and of course, attachment theory is just one of many models, right? What is that notion from uh, the English statistician? I bet a lot of you quote this guy, right? Uh, Dr. Box, what was his first name? I'm forgetting his first name, and that's funny how the brain works. But Mr. Box, whose first name escapes me for some reason, if one of you remember it, that'd be great. Just type it in the, type it in the chat box, speaking of boxes, was famous for saying, all models are wrong. Some are useful. And so that's, I guess that's another piece I'm offering to our concoction here is all models are wrong, some are useful. I wanna say his name was Albert E.B. Box or something like her, Edward E.B. Box. With the spirit of that, I offer this. With Bert Powell, who himself was trained as a psychodynamic therapist, and his colleagues, uh, just a little north of here, up in Spokane, Washington, are famous for their circle of security, right? An entire approach that really makes good use of attachment theory and, and certain psychodynamic uh, object relations would no doubt get in there too. And their notion, what they do is really interesting. And the reason I offer this for you is that it says something really, really interesting. We were mentioning earlier about Heidel Lee Saul's work with studying premature children and stimulation environments where they first come into the world so early. How do you replicate? What kind of relationship? How are we going to modulate stimulation to make it most womb-like, to help them recover, to help them reduce the influence of those insults that may have happened even before they were born. Well, let's extend that a little bit. What Burt Powell talks about here in the Circle Security, he and his colleagues, like Hoffman, Marvin, and, and uh, Cooper, up in Spokane talk about is they'll videotape, right? Folks like we know, you know, marriage and family therapists will do that. Folks who study attachment theory will do that. They'll see the dynamic between the caregiver and the child. Is it an insecure, secure attachment? What are some features of that? one of the things they landed on is really remarkable, and I think it has implications for thinking a great deal about how human beings develop, right? So from an attachment theory standpoint, this is uh, kind of like a blueprint, right, for how human beings build those relationships or how they build may seem a little imprecise for you. But one of the things they notice is the caregiver, represented here by two large hands, provides a secure base and because the child is separate, the child is not a clone of the caregiver, the child is not simply an extension, to allow that nervous system embodied in that little, little person to go explore. And there's a way to be vigilant and allow that child, wherever the child is on that developmental, you know, wherever the child is developmentally, may in part determine how much space that winds up being, right? 
watching, being vigilant, right? Observing, reinforcing it. I see you get those notions about reinforcement in there, among other things, right? And sooner or later, we find that sooner or later, the child comes back, right? That's the circle. With the relational stance of the caregiver being, being bigger, stronger, wiser, and kind, whenever possible, letting the child take the lead, whenever necessary, stepping in and kind of redefining those dynamics, setting those parameters in the name of safety. And then when the child comes back, there's an opportunity to organize, process, reprocess, protect. If there's an our way to take care of it, negative and positive reinforcement, taking away pain, adding some sort of comfort, adding some sort of reinforcement that way. Oh, what a good job. It's really interesting. What did you discover? And relying primarily on those, right, those forms of, of reinforcement as opposed to punishment. And of course, where this doesn't go well, because this is a blueprint for all human relationships, some would even say that the secure base safe haven is kind of like the universal notion of home. Some practitioners will say they conceptualize the big hands as kind of like a heart, a place where people come to integrate their experiences and to achieve a sense of wholeness, right? So it's really, really beautiful. So whether you're, you know, and we can see this, get one of the notions is, Right, is that we one way we might assess how families or couples, starting with couples, if you think of it as kind of a structural way, might be the foundation of a family unit. You'll oftentimes hear folks say, George E.B. Box, thank you, Amanda. <laughs> George E.B. Box, very good. You might, you might go, you might think, okay, if I, if I, from a structural standpoint, I look at a given family, I might start with, well, okay. What are the histories? You might start thinking of like Gestalt family therapy, right? What are the histories of the two caregivers, right? The parental subsystem, and how did they, whom do they bring into bed with them? What about their histories? What about their past? What do they bring into this relationship? What is unresolved, and how do these things kind of, if you pardon the uh, pardon the expression, unconsciously right trigger each other? in such a way that they don't allow this room, this circle to take place very well. They're either very clingy and they don't let their partners go very far and go do their magic in the world and then come back home and process what they experienced, or they're unavailable when the person comes back, they're emotionally unavailable, right? So when the person comes back full circle, this is their home, this is their secure base, this is their haven, how do they do that? Now, as it relates to how those individuals have developed, it becomes an interesting thing to explore. And people like Nadine Burke Harris, who is whose TED Talk, right, her TED Med video back in 2014, is just masterful, right, of really being a good conversation starter about, let's take a look at those adverse experiences. I mean, starting with the original adverse childhood experiences studies of 1997-98 in Kaiser Permanente in, in San Diego, she started there, but look at all that that's led to, right? The, the studies being replicated in nine or more countries in more than 30 states. And they keep funding these same things, these same health outcomes when these things, these basic human needs, right? Attachment, belonging, connection, nutrition, water, warmth. When they don't get met consistently, that the organism, the child, makes those memories of suffering and tries to compensate. So when, uh, so these show up in a lot of different ways in health outcomes, and you might argue that the adverse child experiences studies have led to so much thinking. Some folks would say maybe not quite sophisticated enough. Maybe it's a good conversation starter. Maybe it's been politicized. Organizations all over the country, including governmental organizations, have used the adverse childhood experiences studies, right, to justify integrated care initiatives, whole person complete care initiatives. So I know there's a lot of debate, there's a lot of politicizing about it. Clinicians have a lot of debate about it as to how important those were, should we question? No doubt, you know, that, that's a piece of it. But one thing that I took from Bruce Perry, you might connect to what we've already been saying is that the child is making these memories where the connection would be one of those basic needs, right? Would argue that we are, you know, human beings have not evolved so much over the last 5,000 years is to overcome the needs that we had when we were raising kids in villages and caves 
where you have multiple caregivers, multiple people offering an opportunity to have a dynamic like the one you're seeing here on the screen, that if one person's not emotionally available to do it, one person's being overwhelmed, one person's working too hard, one person has lots of worries, a lot of psychosocial stressors, that there would be a number of other people, perhaps, who could be caregivers, the extended family or the community, like we did in caves 5,000 years ago. And how do we compensate for that when that's not happening? And what kind of memories do we make? How do we develop and what are the health outcomes? That might, you know, so we think about what informs these health problems. I have a suspicion that all of you have very strong ideas about well, what am I trying to do to help people recover? What am I trying to do? What am I focusing on? How much of the past am I going to focus on? Uh, some of you might be making associations around Abraham Maslow, right? With a hierarchy of needs. So if the organism is not getting those needs at the bottom of the hierarchy that we're talking about, right? You know, the connection, the attachment, the warmth, the nutrition, the water, the security and safety, the belonging, the connection with other people, having certain knowledge, understanding certain things about self and the world before you ever reach your potential or self-actualize or however you'd like to call that. Bruce Perry is really good at kind of thinking about, okay, let's look at the nervous system and everything attached to it. Let's look at the nervous system and everything attached to it. And how, how does that work, right? Can we look at those early relationships? Can we see how people overcome the effects of making memories when these things are not happening? So that's the neurosequential model. We're kind of turning the brain upside down, the brain stem and the cerebellum, the midbrain or diencephalon, the limbic system, and then the cortical system above that. So he frequently says, how can we expect kids to concentrate, to think of the consequences of their actions, to set goals, to follow through on them, to have some sense of what it's like to be in someone else's shoes, right? To complete something they start, you know, to be less impulsive, if they've made memories without their basic needs being met consistently, is the prefrontal cortex that seems to be associated, I know we're oversimplifying, more about that in a bit, how do we expect them to perform well in school? How do we expect them to concentrate or to play well or to finish what they start, to have better impulse management, to better tolerate distress? How do we expect them to do anything mindfully if they've made all these memories early on while they suffered? Okay, blah, 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 blah. Feel free to type anything in the chat if there's something I'm leaving out or you wanna make sure your colleagues have a sense of, feel free to ask questions. Okay, lovely. So now the next set of suggestions I'm offering you have to do with the power of connectivity and vulnerability. Now you may have already, this may feel a bit fractal to you in a way, like well each one of these maybe overlaps so much with all the other considerations, right? That you're thinking, well yeah, you're just kind of repeating things for me. That's fine, I respect that. So who comes up for you when you think of connectivity and vulnerability? So maybe you associate that with all kinds of people. And maybe you're thinking about how good that cheesecake would taste, because I know I am right now. See, I haven't had lunch yet. So I'm already getting, I'm already inducing myself to have, to have hunger, I guess, to be hungry and thinking in Spanish. Okay. Power of connectivity. So we've already suggested, right, something about connectivity as being a wonderful thing. Maybe you associate connectivity with Bessel van der Kolk or Dan Siegel, folks who talk about the power of, you know, your nervous system. We're going to be, I'm going to bring those folks up too, right? Or maybe you're thinking about the work of someone like Irvin Yalom, right? And the power of recapitulating the family or getting groups of people together and focusing on the here and now. Maybe that's already come up, right? You're thinking about the opportunity to resolve what people in the group have gone through by helping them have a sense of family, right? To recreate that, to make, to help the group feel so safe in the here and now, to get used to that, that things that are unresolved might come up and now you have all those people there in that social community with whom you can actually have available right there to utilize, to recreate, to role play, to bring up unresolved memories, to bring up those, those issues that haven't quite gotten settled, right? 
that when people give that much, have that much safety in the here and now, as family, as familiar, the Latin word for family, that in that opportunity, they might resolve right there in this living laboratory through their connection, they can develop, have all, right? So as you've studied urban yellow, right? You have all of these curated properties of very process-oriented groups, very as existential, here and now, let that be the therapy. Maybe you've already had a sense of connection with that notion, and like Scott Miller's work, hmm, could there be something about that here and now, that relationship, that attachment, that focus on the connectivity, the getting social needs met, of being in a village, now that person who was once suspicious now becomes your mother, your father, right? your, your ex-spouse, a child, a relationship you lost, someone you cared for, life you offered you all these transitions, and now you have an opportunity to have a sense of peace about a resolution, maybe clarity, even when uncomfortable. How, does, how do we help that happen? How do we get people used to that? How do we help them have a sense? Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful, Elizabeth. That's outstanding, right? Yeah, to see the two-year-old go around the room and feed her goldfish, her husband. Oh, how beautiful, that connection. Showing us how much enjoyment she gets from having an influence on us feeling happy, right? How does a two-year-old, right, have that kind of power, that kind of influence, just coming from a place of heart, right? It may just have this beautiful unconscious quality to it. Just seems somewhat, some might even argue innate, right? Doesn't know any differently than to just give from that place, right? So maybe that speaks to vulnerability as well, right? Possibly. A couple of folks come to mind. Of course, we could talk about so many people, including Elizabeth's daughter, right? That's just delightful. Lynn McTaggart is a pretty interesting character. So if you ever saw the movie, What the Bleak Do We Know? It really had kind of two versions, right? The original and the Down the Rabbit Hole, very controversial, very quirky movie like Portland itself, which is where it was filmed, right? So the, the, the movie starts out, right, in a scene in Goose Hollow, so uh, not far from here, from where I am right now, right? The movie starts out there on a typical rainy Portland day, right, like in the fall of the winter and the spring and just about everything but a few weeks in the summer. <laughs> anyway, we get to see the main character handle life's transitions, right, learn some lessons about how to resolve what has happened to her. She had this really traumatic thing happen to her. You say, well, where does Lynn McTaggart figure out this? Well, she's in both of the movies, the first one and in this deeper version down the rabbit hole where you, the user, get to decide how far down the rabbit hole you wanna go, all the way to level nine, interestingly. Lynn McTaggart is a journalist from England, if I remember correctly. Although if you hear her talk, you might not think she's English, so I don't know what that's about. It's famous for her work in her books about the bond and the power of eight and the field, other books that seem to speak a lot about the power of human connection. Now, Lynn McTaggart folks go so far as to say, we've all been sold a bill of goods, that there has to be a winner, that there has to be a loser, that there has to be competition. Competition is all about competition. She offers a notion in her books, I think you might see, and perhaps you've, uh, you might have thought of this if you've had exposure to her, that she speaks a great deal about the, the future of humanity, the future of humankind, the survival of our species may rest upon our ability to recognize that we do this by cooperating, that we allow ourselves to recognize the connection between us, that we recognize that we really have much in common. I saw an interview recently with Malcolm Gladwell, great, great writer, right? Phenomenal writer. And Malcolm Gladwell, right? Of course, I imagine a lot of you are very familiar with Malcolm Gladwell. And what does Malcolm Gladwell describe about the power of us recognizing, in that interview I heard him saying, that we really do share a great deal and that what ultimately is gonna help our species overcome so many challenges, including the things that tend to divide us and historically divided us, really have to do with finding those features in other people, right? That we might avoid everything being, as Dan Siegel says, right? One, how can you tell that the history has not been resolved? How can you tell the memories have not been resolved? We, in our thinking, feeling, sensing, and behaving, thinking, feeling, sensing, and behaving, 
we tend to experience things as rigid, one extreme or the other, or chaotic, swinging between the two. One extreme or the other, or swinging between the two. And of course, in our business, right? Oh yeah, thank you, thank you, Mira, that's wonderful. Yeah, talking to strangers. That's, that sooner or later we're faced with, are we gonna pathologize that? You know, what do we want to do about that? Even in the pathologizing, we, if we're not careful, we could perhaps be perpetuating these things. And of course, all of you are probably very familiar with Brene Brown, who makes such a great argument, doesn't she, about the role for compassion and courage and connection, right? And ultimately, she talks a great deal about the power of vulnerability. How far will I risk to extend a hand to say, let me discover in you what we share. May we generate an opportunity for harmony and peace, not because we're clones. Let me move past tolerance. Let me embrace. So that speaks to cultural competencies, beautiful connection, doesn't it? Okay. Cultural competencies, beautiful connection to trauma sensitive, trauma informed, trauma responsive, trauma strategic right? Whatever term you like to use, putting, as Bruce Perry says, putting the prefrontal cortex back online, be making it open for business, the most human part of the brain, right? What is it Carl Rogers said near the end of his career? The future of our species may rest upon our ability to remember what it's like to be the other. Let's move past tolerance. Let's embrace our differences as we discover what we have in common. And that takes vulnerability, that takes risk. Yeah, how about that? So I know I'm not telling you anything new. Isn't it a nice confirmation, right, of the power of these things? Yeah, of course, Brene Brown's videos on vulnerability are probably among the most watched in TED, right? Just wonderful. So what does this mean? <laughs> One of the things I got from Bruce Perry, uh, among many things, was how powerful it can be to let go of old ways of interpreting what has happened. What happens if we let go of old concepts of the self and the world? And how do we as professional helpers facilitate that? Notice I use the term facilitation. Right. Yeah, that's beautiful, Rose, that's lovely, yeah. So Kristen Neff, I'll have to look Kristen Neff up. That, that rings a bell, I'll look that up, that's lovely. So Bruce Perry talked about, okay, so how do we help people let go of old ways, old habituated ways, old, uh, yeah, oh yeah, certainly Paul. Yeah, uh, Rose was saying, Kristen Neff has a great short form questionnaire that sparks great discussions with adults about self-compassion. I think Rose, you predicted exactly where I'm headed. <laughs> that's exactly, that's one of the, one of the places I'm headed to. Uh, Karen says, would mental illness or major depressive disorder as a child be considered a trauma that resulted? Uh, we're always faced with that thing of, and Bruce Perry introduces this notion of how many generations shall we look back and see that the family may be carrying these patterns that could have been transmitted from one generation to another, not just by genetics, but maybe by epigenetics and other ways. So if the family for, his, for generations had been subjected to suffering, and made histories of suffering, might that account, I know it's controversial, I'm not saying, it's not certain, right? I'm not offering you black and white here, right? but one model has it that could it very well be that a, a child could have come from generations of suffering, generations of making memories of suffering, and then show up in the world with what we call depression, right? And then what happens in the environment at that point that seems to activate that, that seems to show us evidence of that showing up? right, in the child's thinking, feeling, sensing, and or behaving. And of course, we see with the people we try to help, they'll focus on the behaving as if they were the only thing to look at, or just the behaving and the thinking as if they were the only thing to look at. So that's one of the implications of a whole person approach, right, or a complete care approach is let's not limit ourselves to just one way that these things manifest. So we may call it depressive disorder so that we get paid to do the work, right? That's another thing about our systems, right? Uh, Sandra Bloom, parenthetically, some of you are going, uh oh, he's going off on the deep end now. He's, he's really unwinding. Uh oh, look out. 
Some of you might be familiar with Sandra Bloom out of Philadelphia. And Sandra Bloom, one of the voices of trauma, uh, trauma-informed care, brilliant, right? Because she talks about how our systems perpetuate trauma, how our systems perpetuate oppression, how our systems perpetuate unequal access to care. Uh, it, can, it can happen that way, and entire systems can do that. So the way it is right now, therapists and professional helpers like you oftentimes will say, I kind of feel like I have two brains or something. Like there's the, what gets my organization paid, which helps me get paid as a private practitioner, I need to recognize pathology. But is that ultimately trauma-informed? Is that ultimately culturally competent? On what theories am I basing these interpretations of people? And to what degree am I helping them let go of overly limiting perceptions and experiences, not just perceptions, not just thoughts, but how they feel their own bodies. How do they interact with other people? So Sandra Bloom, Sandra Bloom talks a great deal with the Sanctuary Initiative of how do we perpetuate that? Our systems are saying they gave, they're paying lip service to trauma-informed care and cultural competency, but then our practices of what helps organizations stay in business seem to focus on pathology. Right, is if we, we just know what's pathological, even when the diagnostic and statistical manual says, before you decide that pathological, take the family's culture into account. Take in their values and motivations. Take some time to get to know that. Or our workflows are so focused on assessing for pathology, are we adequately, do we believe that we have enough time to build that therapeutic relationship where we are focusing on their strengths to build on them? We are finding their values and motivations. Right? Do we have time to do it? So these are systemic challenges. Parenthetically, Bruce Perry tells a great story of there was a community in Wisconsin that was saying, we're going to declare ourselves as a trauma-informed community. We're going to make that, you know, we're going to make an official statement of that. We're going to have an official event. And uh, he said, I, I would recommend that you not have me referring to himself, Bruce Perry. I recommend you not have me showing up. I'm a white guy. You know, I'm like, you know, I may not be the best representative to speak to that in that community. I haven't lived in that community. I don't know the realities of that community. Anyway, they talk him into doing it. So he's sitting there and all these folks are talking, right? And you have the, the panel of folks talking. And then finally, one person in the, in the audience stands up and says, yeah, this trauma-informed care thing. Wow, that sounds really good. That's, that's really impressive. Yeah, you guys have, have said a lot of really fascinating things. Uh, what do you suppose you would recommend to our local government and our local communities about reducing food deserts? The people in my community don't have these, and well, I can only imagine what it's like now with the pandemic, don't have an easy way to go get food. They can hardly afford to go get food, much less healthy food. What would you recommend? And Bruce Perry said, what a great reminder, <laughs> right? Of what is most basic? To what degree are we helping people get their basic needs met? How are they gonna reach their potential? How do we assist and facilitate them letting go of old fossilized memories of themselves in the world when basic needs don't get met? Yeah, that's a, you got some beautiful stuff you guys are bringing up. Golly, that feels really good. So to wit, let's bring up a couple of folks from the trauma-informed community. Laura, Laura Van Den Lipsky is a nurse who was educated at Harborview Hospital in Seattle. And some of you might be really familiar with Harborview Hospital in Seattle because that's where Marsha Linehan became famous, right? So she's a, you know, an emeritus faculty member at the University of Washington. And at Harborview Hospital, which also has the county, King County's uh, mental health court, it's quite an interesting place, right? So in the same place, all this healing is going on with mindfulness and this beautiful group practice and people are practicing their skills in Devo and they're identifying their triggers and they're learning how with each other to strengthen their prefrontal cortices and better have better distress tolerance and they're practicing wise mind. It's just beautiful, right? And they're studying all these things. They're kind of cognitive at first, but they make them real, just lovely practice. At the same place that other people are being released at the street right, who are really suffering, who've been kind of left out of the social equation and are left in the street. Well, a nurse in one of the emergency department or the emergency department at Harborview named Laura Vanderdute Lipsky, a very creative and energetic person. If you've ever seen any of her videos on YouTube or, or gone to one of her, read her books, The Age of Overwhelm or Trauma Stewardship, just brilliant, just brilliant, was watching people drop like flies 
was watching the helpers drop like flies. And she started studying. Why are they getting overwhelmed? Why are they getting triggered? Why is there this huge discrepancy, right? So she looked at the, you know, between their expectations and what was happening. So naturally that led her to burnout and compassion fatigue and uh, helper fatigue and vicarious trauma and secondary trauma. It led her down all those paths of studying how that happens. Well, there's the connection with Elizabeth Hudson, who was doing the same thing in Wisconsin. And what they landed on is some pretty interesting stuff. And it speaks to actually not just how you, the helpers, have an increased chance of focusing, as Elizabeth Hudson says beautifully, focusing less on what's wrong with people and more about, as you know, right, what happened to them. And that can go back generations. If you get a chance to look at Bruce Perry's video on YouTube, the Fifth Adverse Childhood Experiences Summit on December 8th, 2018. If you go back and look that on YouTube, Dr. Perry's keynote address, if you watch just the first eight minutes of it, it, it you'll come away with a sense of, yeah, this stuff is not new, man. You know, we're acting like trauma-informed care is a new phenomenon. But the realities of these things go back so, so far. And how many people in our community are telling us, this is nothing new, people. <laughs> This kind of suffering is not a new phenomenon, but the beautiful paradigm shift that Elizabeth Hudson offers are expressed really beautifully in these guided values that take these things into account, compassion, sharing power, tuning in and attuning, just like attachment theory, right? Tuning into people's values and motivations. What is their truth? Before I go deciding to help you, let me find out what your truth is. Before I offer you doses of transition to new ways of thinking, feeling, sensing, and or behaving, let me start with your truth. It doesn't have to be my truth. Let me start with your truth and let me embrace it. Let me come from that place. Let me respect. Let me honor. And take all that into account. Right? Take all of your realities into account. And that includes the reality that shows up in your body and the reality that shows up in your motivations and the reality that shows up in your addictions and the realities and the truths as you've experienced them, I'll come from that place. I will focus on you feeling safe. I will focus on creating a haven, a safe base for you to be in, like the womb. And then I'm gonna coach you to these new ways as you're afraid and you might not follow through very well. You might stumble, you might relapse. Let me promote and coach you and coax you, recognizing that I'm a, I represent a lot of things to you. I, who look like Jerry Springer, guys, you know, I bring up all kinds of associations for people. <laughs> right? When you look like Jerry Springer, you bring up all kinds of stuff for people. But I can represent a lot of things for the people I work with, right? The perpetrator. The, the power monger, the establishment, the system who gets in the way of you reaching your potential. Let me create, co-create, collaborate to do that. And I'm going to, with my role as an influencer, a ethical influencer, informed by the notion that I learned from Milton Erickson's people, I can relax the expectation for control to gain power. Would I settle for power? And so in this role of the co-facilitator, the collaborator with what little time I have, easier said than done, right? Because we bring ourselves into the relationship and our stressors and our challenges. Can I bring that in and cultivate from this relational stance of honor and respect, learning your history and then employing my tools of exactly, <laughs> sorry about that, Bob, I might have activated memories from this place that I'm gonna influence from an informed place with this paradigm shift as, there, as uh, Elizabeth Hudson says, being sensitive to what triggers people, being compassionate, doing it with heart, doing it with connection, doing it with attachment, doing it with a certain degree of vulnerability. I'm willing to be the one who's the student of you. There are things about your reality that I do not know. I know if I'm going to effectively help you. Let me not assume that you want me to help you the way I think I should. Right? We know that. I know that sounds common sense, but it almost sounds cliche, doesn't it? I had a student in a class one time say, teach me how to best help you so I won't assume to do it the way I've done it with other people. 
so it won't do it the same way. And of course, if you look at uh, um, Laura Van der Lipsky stuff, you're going to see that even the sustainability of the planet relies on how we build those relationships, that our relationship with the earth itself might be more like this, and we might save the planet itself. Now, I'll make a reference here to Ken Robinson. I'm, I'm aware I don't want to run out of time here on you. But within the Gilchrist and Ken Robinson, we get into that whole, all our models about right brain, left brain, creativity, putting things in order, the power of creativity, the need for it, to think outside the box, to challenge what has come before. Let's be willing to make new forms. Let's be willing to make new people. We've always done it. We've always made new kinds of people. We always do. We make new forms. We combine things. We, do, we, we take them apart. We reconstruct them. That's how human beings do what they do. We're here to create, some would say. We're here to create. And Ian McGilchrist says in his book, uh, The Master and His Emissary, your right brain really is the master. The left brain's job is to put things in order. The right brain creates for the sake of creating. The left brain puts it in order, makes it real, and sequences it. You need them both. But he argues, uh, there's a lot I could say about Ken Robinson, but just for the sake of time, I'll save it. But Ian McGilchrist and the master and the emissary speaks, makes a really good argument at looking at world civilizations and says, those civilizations that remember that the right brain is the master that we're here to create, tend to be beautiful societies. They are just, they are wonderful. And even their rules are respectful and humane. So I just plant a seed around that, let you be with that. There's so much we could say about all these things. And to give you some examples of what it could look like when you put all these things together, here's what I'm proposing. Here's some examples. We're not limited to this. Of course, naturally, I think EMDR is one of those things. You say, EMDR, isn't that the thing you just wave your fingers in front of somebody's eyes? Why, as it turns out, a lot of folks would say, including those of us who train others in EMDR, would say, maybe the, a really beautiful notion, maybe the most important notion, and Francine Shapiro's wherever, you know, looking down at me, going, okay, Randy, you better represent this well. <laughs> I'm going to show up. Might be the adaptive information processing model. And it simply says, human beings don't know how to do anything but make memories. Right? We're just all the time making memories. And that our organisms have an innate drive towards resolution. We're always trying to get things resolved. And so you might argue that the process of bilateral stimulation, whatever form it comes in, or dual alternating stimulation, as it's sometimes called, because it doesn't have to just to be, it doesn't have to be just by, uh, bilateral, optical, it can be many forms, seems to accelerate the power of a safe, honoring relationship. So all of these things, somatic experiencing, let's access memories in a safe environment, and I'll do things to accelerate it. May just take advantage of that relationship and that the bilateral simulation or accessing memory in a safe environment when we can do things, whether with brain spotting or thought field therapy or tapping or, or whatever it may be, may just have some sort of role in accelerating that. But I, rec you know, I, rec I recognize that's up to a great deal of debate. There's something else I wanted to show you. Oh, yeah. Another one of those practices is greatness circle. So at the end of this, I mean, I have a number of contacts you're welcome to reach out to. I'll give you uh, Kathy Kelling, K-I Kelling at yahoo.com. So I put it in the chat box. Kathy is her first name with an I-E. Kathy Kelly is a, is a facilitator of the greatness circle. And essentially what it looks like is helping people get into the here and now. And the idea is for them to access the eternal core self. Some would say soul, some would say the core self, some say the eternal soul. Now, I don't want to go through all these blow by blow just for the sake of time. But really what's happening is that no one's giving advice or counseling. No one's doing any comparing. No one's focusing on what hasn't worked. It's not a gripe session. It asks people to get used to being in the here and now and talking about some greatness. Focusing on that and just letting people give feedback. I honor you for your kindness. I respect you for your compassion. I accuse you of being an advocate for others and yourself. And one of the notions is, there's a goal here to help people remember who they are, 
to remember who they really are and that all these things that happened to them may have kind of led them astray and has created problems they're still from which they're trying to extricate themselves but this is an opportunity to remember who they are at the core so if you would like a copy of these guidelines i'm, I'm happy to make those available if you don't already have them and then lastly just one notion one practice called fife that's really beautiful it's used in Canada a great deal, and a Canadian physician implemented training this in Arizona. That's how I got exposed to it. And here's what you do with five. I'd be glad to do that. Yeah, kikelling at yahoo.com for Kathy Kelling. Here's what five looks like, and, and it's really beautiful because physicians, right, are really overwhelmed and they're busy and talk about trauma and from care and they're at great risk. Or burnout. We know this about physicians. Those of you who are physicians or other allied medical practitioners are aware of this, right? You have all these demands on you. So, the, so Dr. Thompson implemented this in Arizona and it was really beautiful. And here's what it looks like. Now, see what this does for you. The physician just asked the patient, one, let's focus on feelings. How do you feel? What do you notice in your body, your emotions and sensations? You're actually asking people to tune into this. Now, that's pretty intimate, isn't it? And folks may not be used to that. It may be a bit novel, but that you know, that reveals information. I misspelled ideas. That's interesting. It looks a little profane. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> what that's about? It wasn't strategic. And what do you think it means? So it's an opportunity for the person asking for help to apply an interpretation of it that gives us more information as the helper. Right? It's diagnostic. What do you believe that means? Thanks, Shannon. And then. Now let's look at function. So the second F, how is that affecting you getting what you need? Like how are things working out for you? Like, okay, we're tapping into your emotions, your feelings, the sensations in your body. What do you think it means? What matters? That gets at your values. Let's see how it's affecting you. That helps us kind of prioritize. And then now that we've done that, what do you propose that we do next? What do you expect to happen now? You guys are welcome to use five. It's not like it's, you know, you're welcome to use it. You don't have to, to pay somebody else. So that's an example of five. So now folks, with what little time we have left, I'm, I'm curious is did you get what you need? Did you get at least one common denominator in all of this? Did you find a model that coincides with your own? Or did you find yourself creating your own special sauce? So with what little bit of time we have left, I'm open to your questions or comments, any kind of feedback.